Good morning. This is going to be the last uh, lesson that is uh, labeled as being a Genesis lesson. We may be in Genesis some of the time, but hereafter I'm going to label the lessons as the solution, solution, and then numerical, but I will continue the numbering from uh, the, today's lesson, which is 15, so the next lesson will be solution 16, lesson 16. Father, thank you so much. We are looking at the plan that you have, and we're looking at the the uh, mechanism by which you engineered a solution to the apparently insoluble problem that you required the spiritual death of an individual uh, to fulfill your sense of justice, but uh, there was nobody available. And so we are interested in how you have worked the miracle of solving this problem. We ask you to help us to pay attention and to understand how you have worked in this particular problem. We ask you to be with us now as we go on in, in our study, for we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Again, this is uh, what I call the Bible Study Roadmap, and we are still involved in a portion of the of the roadmap, which I'm calling Choosing a People. And one of the first steps in the solution to the problem is that the Lord needs a group of people. And so he is now in the process of developing and choosing uh, among his people. Well, summarize uh, Genesis chapter 33. We left uh, uh, Jacob at Mahanaim. And uh, he was about to confront Esau, or vice versa. And <clears throat> when he was left overnight by himself, he wrestled with the angel of the Lord, dislocated his hip, but uh, he actually prevailed and... The angel of the Lord asked him to let him go, but he said, I won't until you, uh, you bless me. And the blessing was that uh, the angel of the Lord changed his name from Jacob to, to Israel. Now, hereafter in Scripture, the pattern will be when you see the term Jacob, uh, you are talking about the physical ancestor of the physical people that are involved in the nation of Israel. When you see the term Israel, it either means Israel with all of its uh, physical and spiritual components, <clears throat> or it is talking about Jacob, but now with his name changed and his character changed to Israel. Well, in chapter 33, when he finally uh, came in contact with Esau, his brother, turned out that it wasn't so bad. 
The meeting was uneventful, and Esau acted glad to see him. So Esau accepted some of the gifts that uh, Jacob or Israel had uh, planned to give him, and they separately continued moving to the south. Esau, uh, who after, after this will be known as Edom, E-D-O-M, uh, will go down to Mount Seir. He uh, conquered a group of people there. Uh, descendants of Seir. And then Jacob, with his group of people, will continue to go toward Shechem, where he came from when he went to uh, to see Laban. And uh, there got himself two wives and, and two handmaidens. Now this 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 is a rough map. It's, it's a pretty good map, but it's 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 writing is too small. And the lower part where you see these red lines, that is the area of Mount Seir, or uh, the land of Edom. The uh, rectangular red tri. Uh, re rectangular red thing at the top is approximately the area of Shechem. So that, that illustrates the separation that will be between Esau to the south or Edom to the south and then Jacob or Israel up to the north where Abraham ultimately went after he left the Ur of the Chaldees. We're going to look at this point at the uh, family of Jacob in a pretty schematic uh, sort of way. Uh, his two wives were Leah and Rachel. Now, Leah was the older of the two sisters. Um, Jacob really wanted Rachel. He fell in love with Rachel, and he worked seven years to get her as his wife. But Laban switched uh, Leah for Rachel on the wedding night, and so he worked. Uh, Jacob worked seven more years to get Rachel. Rachel. Um, was was seen by the Lord to be less favored than Leah. And so, because of that, Leah's womb was opened and she began to have babies. And only at, at the very last of uh, the development of this, this family did Rachel have any... Uh, children. So the numbers beside these uh, are represent the order of birth. Reuben is number one, then Simeon, Levi, and so on. And we see Dinah under Leah. She is the only daughter that we have the name for. We know that there are other daughters involved. But Dinah is the only one whose name is given. And then Zilpah, who is the handmaiden of Leah, has two children, Gad and Asher. And then Rachel has the last two sons in Joseph and Benjamin. And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, has two sons, Dan and Naphtali. Now, I'm going to take up some rearrangements that are going to occur within this family. And I want to emphasize at the beginning, as some of these rearrangements will occur in the process of some of these human beings' uh, failure, 
in some respect. The emphasis I want to make is that God lives in eternity. God, God is uh, uh, good. God is just. And God does not generate evil activity. Some of the rearrangements that we're going to see took place through human failure. And be careful that you don't misunderstand that God caused these failures. But he knew the people intimately and he knew what they were like, and he even knew precisely what they were going to do, and he used the results of the failures to rearrange some things in the family. So when we do that, just, just do not blame God for the individual failures that occurred. Let's take up Reuben. He is uh, chronologically the firstborn. And from Genesis chapter 35, it says, It came about, while Israel was dwelling in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now, that's incest. Uh, and... Uh, this made him disqualified to receive the benefits of a firstborn. In that culture, the firstborn has uh, a large portion of the inheritance and has many other um, very good things, but Reuben now has disqualified himself as being the firstborn. And so Genesis uh, 49, this is, this is when Jacob or Israel is going to give a thumbnail sketch of his uh, sons and, and what they're like and some prophecy of what's going to happen to them. Here's his summary of Reuben. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Uncontrolled as water, you shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. As a result, this is what the new uh, schematic uh, picture looks like. Reuben is marked out as the legal firstborn. You also notice that I have marked out Bilhah because she is the one that he lay with and uh, therefore uh, uh, did some incest. Uh, but she undoubtedly was to some extent also guilty. Now the next two in order are Simeon and Levi. So in Genesis 34, uh, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came upon the city unawares and killed every male. Now let me... Let me explain that they lived at Shechem. The, the Shechemites uh, obviously were Canaanites. And Dinah was considered beautiful by the son of Shechem, the, the ruling people there in the city of Shechem. The son fell in love, uh, so to speak, at least lusted after Dinah, and actually raped her. 
Now that's a no-no, obviously. And both Israel or uh, Jacob and his sons knew about it. And so the boy fell in love with Dinah and came to uh, the sons and said, we will, uh, the men of Shechem would like to intermarry with your women. And what they said was, okay, we'll consider that, but you're uncircumcised. You cannot enter into our family unless you're circumcised. So they fell for it. All the men of Shechem were circumcised which apparently is a very disabling procedure. And while they were disabled, uh, Simeon and Levi killed all of the males in Shechem. Then the summary about Simeon and Levi in chapter 49 of Genesis Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. In their anger they slew men. Cursed be their anger, for it's fierce, and their wrath, for it's cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now, I don't have the reference for it, but uh, uh, Jacob or Israel's re reaction to that was, you have caused me to stink among the people of the land. And so, as a result of that, the inheritance, and this is in Joshua 19.9, the inheritance of the sons of Simeon was taken from the portion of the sons of Judah. For the share of the sons of Judah was too big for them. Now this has to do when after they enter, enter the promised land and the land is apportioned among the various sons of Jacob or Israel. The share of the sons of Judah was too large for them. So... Sons of Simeon received an inheritance in the midst of Judah's inheritance. Now, it is not totally clear whether they had some marked out land within the land of Judah or whether they were simply mixed in with Judah. Um, however, for all practical purposes, after this, we can consider that they became part of the tribe of Judah, even though the people may have been distinguishable. Now behold, the Lord says, I have taken the Levites from among the sons of Israel instead of every firstborn. Remember at the Passover, the angel of the Lord the death angel, the Lord himself, killed all the firstborn, both of animals and people, in every house where the blood of the Passover lamb was not spread upon the, the doorpost. So, after that, uh, the Lord says, You owe me. I did not kill the uh, firstborn of Israel. And so I'm going to take Levi in return for that. Behold, I've taken the Levites from among the sons of Israel instead of every firstborn. The first issue of the womb among the sons of Israel. So the Levites shall be mine. And <clears throat> therefore, in Deuteronomy, Levi does not have a portion or inheritance with his brothers. The Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God spoke to him. 
As a consequence of this, two things happened. One is that Simeon and Levi lost their positions as the as the firstborn instead of Reuben, and they also, as a result, lost land after the land was apportioned in the promised land. So, this is how this leaves us. Uh, the first three in birth order have lost their positions as firstborn, legal firstborn. Judah comes next. Uh, I'm not going to use this particular detail in this passage, but look at Judah. Now, Judah has become the legal firstborn. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh. Uh, that's a little uncertain is what it means. Probably is referring to the Messiah until Shiloh comes. And that is Judah will provide the first legitimate and principal king in addition to now being the legal firstborn in the family. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This is again from Genesis 49, where Jacob or uh, Israel is giving a description of his sons and some prophetic ma message about each of them. So Judah becomes a firstborn legally. He will provide the first legitimate, I'll elaborate on that when the time comes. He will also provide the first legitimate and the principal king. Meanwhile, we need to consider how God goes about getting more people, so I am uh, not going to pursue Judah at this point nor any of the other of the sons of Jacob until we get to here. There is another firstborn. Now, if you remember Jacob, when he went to Laban, wanted Rachel as his wife. He worked seven years, and then there was a switch. And then he worked seven more years to get Rachel in addition to Leah. So he had two wives. But he always considered that Rachel was his real wife. That's who he thought he was working for, and she, the one he really loved. But she's been barren. She has not born in it children up until the last. She finally bears the last two sons of Jacob, and then with the second son, she dies in childbirth. So, let's look at some of that. Genesis 30, and God remembered Rachel, and God gave heed of her to open her womb. So she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. She named him Joseph, which means add or add to, saying, May the Lord give me another son. And later on, as they were journeying from Bethel, and they were going toward Ephraim, then they journeyed from Bethel when they were still some distance to go to Ephrath in Bethlehem. Rachel began to give birth and she suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. That is what you wished for. 
It came about as her soul was departing, for she died in childbirth, <clears throat> that she named this new son, Son of my sorrow, Benoni, because she was very sick and dying at his birth. But his father, Jacob or Israel, called him Benjamin, son of the right hand. Now Israel loved Judah, Joseph, more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a very colored tunic. Uh, the King James Version says it was a coat of many colors. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I've had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. You can imagine that they would not like that. Then his brother said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And I have a little note to see Revelation chapter 12. Um, that passage has to do with a woman appearing. And the woman is said uh, by the Catholic Church to be Mary, but it clearly relates, her description relates to the dreams of Joseph, which indicates that they are, uh, that the woman is Israel, and in particular, the portion of Israel that leads to the Messiah. He related it, this dream, to his father and his brothers. His father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream you've had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? Then he, Jacob, a little bit later, said to him, Joseph, Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock. They were off tending the sheep. And bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, What are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. Then the man said, They have moved from here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went out after his brothers, and found them at Dothan. When I was uh, young, I spent a good bit of time in Dothan, Alabama, and whenever Dothan was referred to locally, the passage that it says, Genesis thirty-seven seventeen because of this reference to Dothan, 
Now, this dolphin um, was not in Alabama. When they saw him from a distance, and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say, A wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben, Reuben looks pretty good here. But Reuben heard this, rescued him out of their hands, and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So it came about, when Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped him of his tunic, the multicolored, or coat of many colored, the very colored tunic that was on him. They took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it, so he didn't drown. Then they sat down to eat a meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not lay our hands on him, for he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders. Now Midian is a descendant of Ishmael. Uh, some Midianite traders passed by. So they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. So they took Joseph's tunic, slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, we found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters, now see, he had all his daughters. We only know the name of one, Dinah, but she apparently is not his only daughter, arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol, the grave, in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Going to stop here. What has been accomplished here is that Joseph believes to be killed by his father believed him to be killed has now been moved down to Egypt. And this is a step in the direction of gaining people for the people of the Lord.
Father, thank you. It's so delightful to see things work out according to the plan of God, and we know that it will be accomplished without fail. Go with us now. Keep us safe until next week. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.